The scripture today is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 7 through 13, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. When you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by reading, repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them, for your father knows exactly what you need even before you ask him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today the food we need and forgive us our sins as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us yield to temptation but rescue us from the evil one. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Kay, and thank you especially for reading from that translation this morning. So today is Father's Day, and to those of you who are fathers, to those of you who have happy associations with, happy memories of your father, I hope that it is a joyous day. Glad that you're spending part of it here with us. It seems really fitting to me that on Father's Day, we turn to prayer to the Father we share. We pray a lot in worship. I hope that all of you pray a lot at home. But there's prayer and then there's prayer. I am reminded of a line from Meredith Wilson's other play besides The Music Man, that play, The Unsinkable Molly Brown, in which the preacher says, when you pray for something and it's no go, don't come around with I told you so. Your prayer was answered. The answer was no. He heard you all right. I love that line. I mean, it's a line that no preacher would really ever say, I don't think, to a congregation And I love it for that reason. But I also love it because it reminds me of important things about our prayer. First thing is that God hears us when we pray. Second thing is that God gives us what God knows we need, but not always what we want. The third thing, and perhaps the most difficult thing, is that God rarely steps into the natural order of things to give us what we pray for, even when we want it desperately. I think about families with whom I have prayed at the hospital bedside of a loved one, and we have prayed earnestly for God's healing mercy. And it has come, but at times it has come As that loved one's body fails, the healing comes in death. Because after all, death is a part of this mortal life. And much as I would like that not to be true, it's still true. And so we pray knowing that our will may not be God's will in a situation. Jesus knew that people would need help with their prayer life. Here in our text for today, which is a part of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches the crowds about prayer. He tells them not to flaunt their their prayers in public, looking to look more pious than other people. Doing that is all the reward you get. Other people's thinking that you're somehow special. He tells them not to heap up a lot of words to get God's attention. That's not necessary. God knows what we need and is listening to our prayers. How many of us have wanted at the Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner table to say to the person who is called upon to pray and praise until the gravy is cold and clotted, Don't heap up your prayers with lots of words. You don't need to do that. Jesus gives us a structure for our prayer. 
that puts things in perspective. We call that structure the Lord's Prayer, and we pray it with a few additions to what Kay read us in the text every week as we gather. Jesus says, start with the words, our Father. Our, to remember that we are a part of a big family. God does not have only children. God had one only begotten son. But through that son, we all are adopted into God's family together. Our. Father, to remind us that it is a loving family relationship that we have a relationship in which we are loved long before we can love in return. We are cared for. Our needs are tended to. In the 1980s, when we were headed toward a time when one out of every two marriages ended in divorce and half of all children grew up in single-parent homes with absent fathers, the Reverend Diane Tennis wrote a book entitled, Is God the Only Reliable Father? I remember on Father's Day in, I think it was 1984, getting up in church where I went to church then. We got up and shared concerns and celebrations before we prayed. It was a smaller church. I got up and celebrated Diane's book because it had been so meaningful to me to remember that in the midst of the brokenness of our lives, God is faithful. To remember in the chaos of our world, God is there. God is reliable. God can be counted on even when things look their darkest. That book is long out of print, so if you, if you check for it on Amazon, you won't find it. But reading it helped to shape my own understanding of the nature of God's fatherly love for us that accepts us in the midst of our human failings, love which itself never fails. Jesus said, say in heaven to remember that God is above all the limits of this world. Jesus said, hallowed be your name, which most of us, not all of us, the choir sings it, most of us, unless we're referring to hallowed halls of the institutions where we went to school, never use outside of the Lord's Prayer. Kay read to us a different version, which I love, which puts it, your name be honored as holy. To remember to honor God's name as holy is to remember not to take it in vain, not to call on God in ways that don't honor God. Your name be honored as holy. And then Jesus says, pray for what puts our own will in line with God's purposes. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In reality, when we say those words, we are praying the same thing twice. Some of you have heard me say before that in Hebrew there is no comparative and superlative, and so if you want to say you really mean something, you say it two or three times. In the kingdom of God in all its fullness, as it was at the creation before sin entered the world, God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. And so we pray for the kingdom of God to come among us, and we pray it like we really mean it. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then, when we have prayed for what we know God wants and prayed like we really mean it, then and only then do we turn our prayerful attention to what we need. Jesus says, pray first for daily bread. You may remember in the Exodus 
story, as God led the people through the wilderness, God provided bread every day. And Moses told them, only take what you need for today, except on the day before the Sabbath when you are to collect for both days. If you'll do that, there will be enough for everyone. And so, still in line with what God wants, we pray for what we need for daily life. This day's bread, but not extras. What we need, not necessarily for what we want. The trouble with praying for what we want and not thinking about all of our brothers and sisters around us who are also children for whom God provides is that praying for what we want can incline us toward greed. I'm reminded of a story from the Brothers Grimm fairy tales, which I loved when I was a child. It is the story of the fisherman's wife. I'll summarize it for you in case you don't know it. A fisherman went out one day and caught a magic fish. And the fish, who was a talking magic fish, said to him, if you'll let me go, I'll grant you a wish. And the man said, okay, I'll let you go. But I need to go home and consult with my wife Because if I go home having asked for something that I want that she doesn't want, yeah, it's not going to work. So the fish said, fine, you know, I'll I'll hang around, just come back, tell me what you want. So he goes home, he consults with his wife, his wife says, I want a bigger house. He goes back, he tells the fish, he says, go home, she's got the bigger house. This goes on. She then wants a palace, go home, she's got the palace. She then wants to be king, go home, she may have gender identity confusion, but she's king. She knows what she wants. He comes back another time and says she wants to be emperor. And the fish says, okay, she's emperor. And then she calls her husband into her emperor's throne room and she says, go back. I've decided there's one more thing I want. Tell the fish I want the sun and the moon and the stars. Well, he really doesn't want to go. I mean, the fish has done way more than he bargained for, but she's the emperor. And so he goes, and he tells the fish what she now wants. And the fish says, go home. She's back in the hovel where she was when you and I met, because the sun and the moon and the stars belong only to God. God is not a magic fish. God wants to know from us what we need, but God does not grant everything we wish for that leads to greed. Jesus says, pray to be forgiven your sins as you forgive those who sin against you. Now, that's what Kay read to us today, and I really appreciate, I really appreciate that translation. You know, we Presbyterians say debts, and our Methodist siblings say trespasses. And I've had that explained to me that it's because Scots, from whom the Presbyterians among us descend, are very concerned about money matters, owing and what is owed to them. Methodists, on the other hand, coming out of England, are very concerned about property boundaries and rights. What we all are really praying for is to be forgiven our sins. But Jesus says, pray, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And it must have been important to him because immediately after he ends the prayer, he says to them, if you forgive others their trespasses or sins, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others neither will your heavenly Father forgive you. It's a family we're in. And the way healthy family works is that people say sorry and mean it and understand that what they've done for which they are sorry has been somehow destructive of the health, of the unity, of the family, and so they turn from that thing and don't do it anymore.
And so, in a healthy family, people say sorry and mean it, and people don't hold grudges. To the extent that we hold grudges and refuse to forgive, we separate ourselves from the family members with whom we are family. Be clear, I don't mean, and I am pretty sure Jesus did not mean, that we are to live as doormats, accepting cruelty and meanness and selfishness from family members. Jesus didn't do that in his earthly life, and I don't think that the God who loves us wants that for us. Rather, I think we are asked not to let wrongs do to us so color our attitude toward the people who've done us wrong that they close us off from the possibility that those folks may, in fact, truly be sorry and want to be welcomed into life together in family because God has worked in their hearts and they've changed and they've come to grow to trust that they can live in humble reliance on God's grace and in equal loving relationship with other folks in the family. After all, can we really be witnesses to God's love if we hold resentment in our hearts? Jesus says, do not lead us into temptation or bring us to the triumph of trial. I think I heard Kay read, protect us from temptation or words to that effect. Anyway, Pope Francis, shortly after he became folk, said to the Roman Catholic brothers and sisters that we have, it might be a better thing to pray, a truer thing to pray, to pray protect us from temptation because the God who loves us does not put temptation in our paths. Jesus says to the disciples in the garden on the night in which he was betrayed, pray that you may not come into the time of trial for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And they proved that the flesh was weak by falling asleep instead of praying. And so we pray that God will keep us from trials and will protect us from evil or from the evil one. And of course God will. If you've read all the way to the end of the book, that is the Bible, you know God wins. God's will is done. God's own are called to live with God forever and all suffering, all death, all evil is overcome in God's purposes. That's what Jesus teaches us to pray for, to remember together that we are God's family and God loves us. That the most important thing is for God's will to be done. That in that will there is enough for our daily needs, enough and to share. That there is mercy and forgiveness for us and we are to share that too. That with God there is protection from evil that comes to us from outside ourselves and there is protection from the temptations we feel in our own hearts to do what is wrong or to not do what is right. The church has added to Jesus' prayer the words that we say at the end. I think of them as a kind of commentary on the prayer itself. They circle us back to the beginning. Thy kingdom, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. When we say these words, we are reminded of the way we begin, that God is our Father who can do far more abundantly than ever we can ask or think. Because God is in charge. God has the power to do what is right and needful, to protect us and comfort us, to shape our lives more and more into the likeness of Christ, and to redeem the world from the evil that we know is active in it. Because of this, all glory belongs to God now and forever. And maybe the most amazing of all God is our Father who loves us. Thanks be to God. Amen. That concludes my series on the parts of the worship service. Next Sunday, we will have a hymn sing to celebrate together that part of our worship that is hymn.